Okay, they're taping this, so uh, feel free to interrupt and ask a question if I don't make something clear, all right? Or small, so uh, I'm going to talk about angio, angiogenesis, okay? And that's simply the growth of new blood vessels. We did it while we were being formed in the womb. Uh, we do it every day. If you cut yourself, you grow new blood vessels. Uh, and we're using a drug that stimulates this process uh, above what we normally do. And so let me show you an example of, of natural angiogenesis. Uh, this is a wound. Think about this as a kind of a scab. We're looking underneath the scab. See all these little tiny blood vessels here? That's angiogenesis in action. That's healing a cut. And that, but that regenerates all of the skin. It generates sweat glands, nerves, hair follicles. So you get a complete organ of skin here uh, during the angiogenesis process. Uh, and our drug stimulates this process in tissues that need kind of extra boost, a boost in their blood supply. So we call it therapeutic angiogenesis. Uh, we induce this with a drug. And we're treating diseases where there's a chronic lack of uh, blood vessel formation. So when you cut yourself, that's very acute. You need to form blood vessels right away. Uh, in heart disease, uh, we go through this chronic lack of angiogenesis, which is coronary artery disease. So I'll show you some clinical trial data where we've injected the growth factor into the heart. And after three months, we end up with a situation like this better blood perfusion in the heart. Uh, the patients, you'll hear of them, uh, they do better on a treadmill test. Uh, but in other instances, uh, in fact, 75 human diseases are caused by a lack of blood flow. Uh, heart, we know stroke, but I'm gonna talk to you at the end of the talk about some new uh, findings that brain diseases, such as Parkinson's, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease is also caused is initiated by a lack of blood perfusion. And we think our drug, we will find out this year or next year when we start our first clinical trial in Parkinson's disease here in the United States. <clears throat> okay, let's look at angiogenesis. It's involved, as I mentioned, insufficient angiogenesis, heart disease and stroke. These two things kill over 50% of people in the world. I'm gonna show you some nice data. We have phase two uh, FDA data treating uh, diabetic foot ulcers, so that's more of a wound healing indication. I'm not going to talk about anything of, which is involved with excessive angiogenesis. And I think the best example is cancer, where tumors need a much bigger blood supply because they're dividing rapidly. And there are drugs that actually block excessive angiogenesis. They do the opposite of what we're doing. Uh, and they've been very effective in some forms of cancer. So what cl clinical evidence do we have with our drug? Uh, I'm going to talk about diabetic foot ulcers from a lack of blood flow. Uh, I'm going to talk about coronary artery disease, and then I'll end up talking about uh, Parkinson's disease. So what is our drug? It's a natural growth factor that's in our body. We use it all the time for wound healing. It's called FGF1, uh, fibroblast growth factor. So it's like growth hormone or insulin, it's a protein that we can uh, make large quantities of. I was actually involved in purifying this in St. Louis uh, from cow brains, but we don't get it from cow brains. Uh, we make it with recombinant DNA technology now. And how does a growth factor work? Well, it's very simple. It, here's our growth factor, this little, it binds to a receptor on blood vessels and that starts this whole cascade of angiogenesis where you get a little tube form and that matures into a capillary or small artery. And if we do this thousands of times in ischemic tissue, we can really bring a lot more blood into that tissue. Uh, again, we don't get the product from cow brains. We get it from uh, this is a clean room. Uh, we can grow the protein up in bacteria and get unlimited quantities for our clinical trials. So let me show you some examples uh, of clinical use of the FGF1. I'll first start with wound healing. Uh, diabetics, uh, 
about 10% of diabetics every year get what's called a foot ulcer, these nasty, deep wounds that are chronic. They, they can't heal. Uh, and they can get infected. They're the major cause of lower limb amputation in diabetics. So it's a very feared complication if this gets infected. So we apply, this is a topical application of that FGF1 protein. We put it right into the wound. We cover it with an occlusive dressing, and then we look at healing rates. Uh, in, first, we did animals. Uh, this is diabetic mice. There's a wound in their skin, and you can see if you treat them with FGF1, that wound closes very nicely after 15 days, where it's open in the untreated uh, animals. Now, you can do the same type of experiment in humans, and here's, uh, this is an FDA phase two trial, so that's kind of the middle of the clinical development. Uh, here's one of those diabetic foot ulcers three weeks before treatment. Uh, then we treat with our drug. We get healing of that ulcer where the untreated ulcer remains open after five months. So you can measure the rate of wound healing, and uh, we can see about a five-fold acceleration in wound healing in these diabetic foot ulcers with these patients. And the results of that phase two trial were very uh, pleasing. We closed every, 100% of the ulcers closed after about five months of treatment, where the untreated ulcers, about 35%, remained open. Uh, so that's a very good result, and we hope to take this into phase three trial before uh, FDA approval. Okay, let's move to coronary artery disease. This uh, is a different application. We are injecting the growth factor directly into the heart. I'm going to show you a video of some patients that were treated. Uh, and in the video, you'll see it's a surgical application. We actually make an incision in the chest and inject directly. But in the next trial, we actually have a catheter. So we can insert the catheter, and we come right into the inside of the heart and inject from inside of the heart, the same growth factor that was used before. Uh, before I show you the video, this is uh, looking at growth of new blood vessels after we treat. This is a person with heart disease. Uh, this is a coronary artery, an angiogram, which you put dye in the coronary arteries. You can see there should be more blood vessels around here. And if we inject the FGF1 and then look three months later, we see this blush work of uh, new vessels in the heart. Okay, And if we do this... 10 to 20 times in this person's heart, we really can increase uh, blood flow. And we put them on a treadmill. They do much better on a treadmill. Uh, their angina settles down, and they do much better. So uh, I supervised at this phase two, this is a phase one trial. Uh, and the patients at our Cincinnati site did so well that ABC News went down and interviewed a few of them. So let me just show you this short video clip. This was a surgical approach. Arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually capable of so growing the brand new one is in that arteries. Little vial and we... The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery, and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing so see there, is there new blood, new vessels, blood right vessels growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. So that, that woman, Constance Donnelly, she was uh, probably responded the best of uh, anyone in the trial. Uh, and we had three dosing groups. We had a low dose, a mid dose, and a high dose. And she actually was in the lowest dosing group. So she got one-tenth the dosage of the drug that some of the other people got, but uh, she responded the best. She was in a wheelchair, and you can see she was standing up after the trial. Uh, and this is not work done by us, but others gave us a clue of why she responded. Uh, so 
Remember I showed you those little Y structures, they're the receptors for our drug. And in her heart and in ischemic hearts, the receptors get upregulated. So this, what we think was a situation in Constance's heart that this is normal heart tissue, you don't really need regeneration of blood vessels. But as you get heart disease and you choke off uh, the blood supply to the heart, basically the heart is crying out for new blood vessels. And the way it does that is by upregulating the receptors here. But unfortunately, she didn't have enough of the drug to kick off a response. So she didn't have enough of natural FGF1. But when we came in here and injected the drug, we gave her a boost and she could start the whole angiogenesis process in her heart. So something like this where this is her upregulated receptors inside her blood vessels and then we bring in our FGF1 uh, to stimulate angiogenesis. So if you put our drug into normal heart tissue, no nothing will happen. It's got to be ischemic, uh, starving for oxygen. Okay, let's look into the brain now. Uh, so the brain is probably your most vascularized uh, organ. Uh, billions of uh, neurons in your brain need a constant supply of uh, oxygen, glucose. And also, importantly, you've got to sweep away metabolic waste products that accumulate in the brain. Uh, we know in Alzheimer's disease, you get an accumulation of what's called the beta amyloid plaque, and we think that's due to insufficient blood flow getting rid of those uh, toxic elements. Now, one concept of uh, the neurovascular unit is where the uh, blood supply in your brain meets up with the nerve cells. So if we go down from the larger arteries uh, to the capillaries, these, these are the smallest vessels in your brain, uh, every one of your neurons has a dedicated capillary to supply it with blood and to take away waste products. So this is capillary bringing blood. Uh, you can imagine if this got clogged by atherosclerosis or uh, damaged by environmental or genetics, you're, you're going to have problems uh, with these neurons. So if this happens in the area of the brain where the dopamine neurons are, which are responsible, they're, they're the ones that go off in Parkinson's disease. Um, so lack of blood <clears throat> blow in a certain area of the brain can lead to Parkinson's. Uh, with Lou Gehrig's disease, it would be blockage of uh, blood flow to motor neurons. And this blockage also affects another population of cells in our brains. These are called stem cells. Uh, no one thought we had stem cells in our brains uh, until about 10 years ago is that we discovered, not we, but others discovered, we all have pools of these immature stem cells in our brain and they need adequate blood perfusion to divide and to mature into neurons. So a lack of blood flow, and I'll show you some, at the end of the talk, some very interesting work coming out of Columbia University Medical School where they looked at these stem cells in normal people, but of different ages. And in older people, uh, they had as many stem cells as younger people, but there was a lack of blood flow to nourish these cells, so they weren't as active. And they thought that was one of the reasons we have cognitive decline as, as we get older. Uh, in stroke, we know there's a lack of blood flow uh, caused by a clot in an artery. Uh, you develop, this is a stroke area, uh, a core of uh, dead neurons surrounded by what's called the penumbra. These are cells at risk, and if you don't get enough, if you don't restore blood flow to this area, you're going to get uh, the death of these uh, cells as well. So we've looked in animal models of stroke. We haven't done a human trial yet, but you can give a rat a stroke. Uh, you can see here's the stroke volume. These are brain slices through the laboratory animal. Uh, I can tell you if you get reincarnated, you don't want to come back as a rat, as a lab rat. These, these guys have a rough life. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> if we treat that, those animals with FGF1, you can see the stroke volume uh, decreases. Okay, this is treated animals, untreated. And if we look in these animals and their brains, we can see what's going on with their capillaries. So let's look at their capillaries. These are the fine, healthy capillaries in normal rat brain. You give those animals a stroke, you can see you decimate the capillary beds in, in those animals. And then if you treat uh, with FGF1, you can see restoration, not quite back to normal, but restoration of these capillaries where if the animals are left just to recover on their own without any drug treatment, this is what you see in the capillaries. You get disordered capillaries, 
Uh, this guy probably is in danger of rupturing again, maybe causing a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, but, so this treated animals are a much more normal situation. And <clears throat> this is one trial we're going to try. It's going to be in chronic stroke. People who have had a stroke have stabilized, and then uh, we're going to treat them uh, chronically. Uh, traumatic brain injury, this is something you would suffer after uh, a car accident. Uh, and we have animal models of traumatic brain injury. So here's, this is a mouse brain, normal mouse brain. Uh, you can give the brain an insult. 24 hours later, you get this uh, injured area of the brain. And then treating with our drug uh, for two to three weeks, you can heal that lesion, uh, again, through angiogenesis and neurogenesis. Uh, now, <clears throat> could angiogenesis slow or even reverse the course of neurodegenerative diseases? So these are the diseases such as Parkinson's, uh, ALS, and Alzheimer's. Uh, so we know in Alzheimer's, the brain shrinks down quite a bit. And we believe one of the initiation causes of this is a lack of blood flow to the brain. And the other... Uh, Complicating factor is the amyloid plaques which form in Alzheimer's. We feel, again, if you had proper blood supply, you might be able to get rid of these. So let's look at a study. Uh, this just came out last year at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, they followed over 1,000 patients with Alzheimer's disease for a long period of time. They looked at the progression of the disease. And they looked at uh, a number of things. They looked at cognitive uh, function. Uh, they looked at the beta amyloid. But importantly, for us, they looked at blood flow. So what's going on in Alzheimer's disease uh, with blood flow? And this is a little bit complicated, but let me just take you through it because it's important. So they looked at progression over 30 years here. This is early Alzheimer's, and this is LO is late onset Alzheimer's disease. And they looked at abnormalities that occur in, in Alzheimer's. So this is abnormal, this is normal at zero. And for example, green, in green here, this is cognitive decline. So as Alzheimer's disease progresses, you get cognitive decline. Uh, beta amyloid is here in red. But what was very remarkable in this study was the very first thing that occurs in Alzheimer's disease in these 1,000 patients was uh, vascular disruption. So this is vascular disruption. So the very first thing that occurs is a lack of blood flow in these patients. Uh, preceding loss of memory, uh, preceding amyloid deposition. So we are planning on starting a phase one study with our drug in early onset Alzheimer's. So we hope if we can stimulate blood flow in these patients early on, perhaps we can delay these later occurring symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, both for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, it'll be uh, about a six-week treatment period. So every day, we're going to give them a one-hour infusion. No, we're not going to go directly into the brain, because that is so invasive. And uh, in other clinical trials, lots of infection occurs. We're lucky our drug, about 5% of it gets across the blood-brain barrier when we give it IV. And so with a one-hour infusion, we get about 5% of the dose into the brain, which I'll show you here with Parkinson's, at least in monkeys, it's, it's enough to regenerate neurons. With Parkinson's disease, this uh, affects the dopamine-producing neurons. Uh, and these dopamine neurons are in a very tiny region of the brain. Uh, this is deep within your, within almost just right above the brain stem, so very deep within the brain. Uh, they're kind of darker colored neurons called the substantia nigra. And when these start dying off, you get the classical movement disorders, the tremors that are seen uh, in Parkinson's disease. We believe this whole disease is initiated by a lack of blood flow to this area of the brain. And others have shown uh, using functional MRI, which can measure blood perfusion in that very tiny region of the brain, uh, if you look at blood perfusion, here's a healthy 21-year-old, maximal blood perfusion, so his dopamine neurons are doing fine. Uh, as we age, sorry, as we age, 
Here's a healthy 65-year-old, okay? Less blood flow in the brain, but not nearly enough to affect those dopamine-producing neurons. Here's Parkinson's disease patients, 50% uh, reduction in blood perfusion. So those dopamine neurons are starting to become dysfunctional and beginning to die off. And some uh, people with strokes in that area get obviously very affected, almost complete lack of blood flow. Now what about in Parkinson's disease and other parts of the brain? Uh, we know other areas are affected. Uh, probably the first symptom in Parkinson's is a, a lack of smell. Uh, speech goes off, but these are not uh, dopamine neurons. These are cortical neurons that are kind of in the front cortex of your brain. And you can do, use that same uh, imaging functional MRI to look at blood flow in the cortex of the brain. And this is a, a woman who had Parkinson's as, as well as dementia. And blue is normal blood flow, yellow is less, and red is severely reduced blood flow. You can see the really reduced blood flow in this woman with dementia. These are areas of our cortex that are involved in memory, uh, in cognition, uh, executive functioning, that type of thing. So with our IV infusion of our drug, we would kind of treat the entire brain. We would hope that we could treat these areas as well as the dopamine producing cells. Okay, so we submitted an application to the FDA to treat patients. We submitted some uh, animal data, efficacy animal data, both in rats and in uh, monkeys. And you can give animals Parkinson's disease by giving them a toxic chemical. Uh, it's a, actually, it's a herbicide, which was found to, it's not Roundup, but it's another herbicide that actually selectively kills off the dopamine cells in animals. Uh, and actually, unfortunately, people, uh, this drug was discovered, uh, Marijuana growers were treating their marijuana plants with this drug, and people who unfortunately smoked that marijuana came down with Parkinson's disease. It was irreversible, so it was a real tragedy. That same drug can be given to uh, rats, and they again develop Parkinson's. This is movement scores, this is normal movement, this is no movement. Uh, animals that were given a placebo, you can see if you give them that toxin, you get dramatic loss of movement in these rats. They develop the tremors of Parkinson's. You treat them with our drug uh, intravenously, you don't get quite back to, to normal, but they're doing much better uh, than these animals. And importantly, if you look in their brains at the dopamine producing cells in their brains uh, without treatment, and the, these are dopamine neurons, new neurons staining brown with, with the stain, we're actually regenerating uh, new neurons in these animals. So that's attacking the kind of the root cause of, of Parkinson's in these, in these animals. Uh, this is a marmoset. You can give a, a monkey the same Parkinson's disease uh, with the same uh, toxin. Here's that toxin MPTP, the herbicide. You give it early on. These are months. Uh, in red is the untreated animals. You can see they slowly deteriorate. This is movement scores. So this is normal and this is abnormal. You can see if month nine you start treating these animals with FGF1, uh, it reverses their disease. Uh, these animals are doing much better in terms of their motor skills than the untreated animals. Again, if you look in their brains, this is very important. Uh, look in this substantia nigra region, which is deep within the brain, without treatment and with the FGF1 treatment, we're regenerating those dopamine producing cells again, attacking the root cause of this uh, disease, at least in monkeys. Now, I mentioned in uh, Alzheimer's, you get accumulation of the beta amyloid protein. Uh, in these monkeys and in people, you get accumulation of a different protein. It's called synuclein, but really the same as in Alzheimer's disease. This is a toxic protein here. This aggregates in the brains of these monkeys. This is toxic to the neurons as well. So we think this plus a lack of blood flow is contributing to the etiology of this disease, uh, at least in monkeys. And when we treat those animals, you can see we dramatically reduce the amount of this aggregated protein in the brains of these animals. Not quite back to normal, but certainly better, better than this. So we have submitted this uh, to the FDA. Uh, they've approved our clinical trial design. Uh, we also are going to do this in Mexico, Monterey, Mexico. And Next week, we're actually visiting uh, Estonia, Tallinn, Estonia, to do a started trial in Europe. 
Uh, we're going to look at three rising doses of the drug. Again, the IV infusion for an hour uh, for six weeks. Uh, no placebo groups, so all patients will get the uh, drug. Uh, we'll be looking at safety, and we'll be doing these Parkinson's disease motor score testing by a neurologist, and we'll follow them out to a year. Yeah. Yeah, so we've submitted this to the FDA. The U.S. FDA has asked us to do one additional animal toxicity study, and that's why we went into Mexico and Estonia. Where they are not going to require that. So in the U.S., the trial won't get started until next summer. Yeah. Now, over the last five or ten years, a number of other uh, brain disorders have a suspected microvascular component. And this list is shown here. So we'll start off in Parkinson's, but we also will do trials, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, MS, Alzheimer's, as I mentioned. Uh, all these diseases, we and others think, have a microvascular component that initiates these diseases. And finally, uh, I mentioned work at Columbia University with aging, just normal aging. Uh, what's going on? Why do our brains function less as we get older? Uh, and this was a very interesting study. Remember I showed you this slide with perfusion in the brain. These are healthy 21-year-old and healthy 65-year-olds. Well, this Columbia study looked at what was going on. Why is there less, uh, why is there cognitive decline as we get older? And uh, Time Health put out a short video on this, and I'll show that to you now. So this is a new study from Columbia University in New York. Why our brains perform worse as we age. So they looked at 28 healthy people who had died suddenly in accidents. Uh, ranging in age from 14 years to 79 years. Uh, they were looking at brains, they were looking at stem cells mainly in different parts of the brain and mainly in the memory parts of these people's brains. They found that older people made as many new neurons in their memory parts of the brain as younger ones do. What is different in the aging brain is a reduced blood flow to nourish these cells. So this is, supports what we're thinking in these diseases we're studying. So the stem cells are dividing less and generating fewer neuron, neurons in the older individuals' brains. So the pool of cells is just not as active in the older individuals. The medical researchers suggested that it might be possible to combat age-related uh, cognitive decline if we're able to improve blood flow to the brain. And so we agree completely with this. Uh, we're not going to do an anti-aging study quite yet, but we think blood flow is, is the key not only to these diseases, but might be useful in regenerating, uh, making our brain, brains work a bit better as we get older. Uh, booth here uh, if you want to learn more about the clinical trials or any, we have investment opportunities. I don't know if our CEO wants to say a few words about that. It